covers it far better than I could ever speak. However, sometimes when we are aware that mentally, physically, spiritually, and sensually all of our senses that God gave us are activated, things can pierce through the ordinary and pierce into your heart. That's the point of what we do here. I'm now going to share some words from Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, 31 to 38, and you will see that we are taking one microcosm piece of what you saw there and uh, taking a look at that this morning. Here are the words of Mark. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful sinful generation Of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. And this, friends, is the words of the Gospel of Mark. Thanks be to God. Praise be to Jesus Christ the only Son of God, who went to the cross for you and rose triumphantly. This morning, we're going to look at Jesus through the eyes of his chosen disciple, Peter. I love the honesty of the Bible. The heroes and heroines of the real scriptures that we read are real people with real faults. Like us, God uses people with real faults to serve Jesus and continue Jesus' ministry, even today. Now, every personality that God created has gifts. When those gifts are used As you walk your faith journey, great things can happen. Even when you don't think so. Even if you think you're just living your life, trying to live up to God's gifts, and you don't see any results. You'll never know. You never know what effect your use of God's gifts to you will have on people that you don't even know. Now, When those gifts sometimes get used to the extreme, that's where we get in trouble. They can even, when used to the extreme, become a weakness. Hmm. Scripture tells us, in many places, that Peter was a loud, talkative, impulsive man who loved Jesus 
passionately. Everything that Peter did was not mundane. Everything that Peter did had a certain passion to it. Now, the Bible highlights his faults, and they become easily identifiable to us as we read his life while he's learning and walking and, and living with Jesus. He bites off more than he can chew. He's very optimistic to the point of being a little naive. And he speaks about everything without thinking. Remember, as you saw, did you see that in the uh, film? He's the one that jumps out of the boat and starts walking to Jesus impulsively until he thought about it. And the moment his humanness overtook him and not his faith eyes, down he goes. Hmm. I love that. Not, you know, not that that's what happened to him. Here's what I love about it. That's the first, not the first time, but one of the times that in spite of his impulsiveness and his spirit and his over-exuberance, ba-boom! Wait a minute, what the heck am I doing? Huh? <gasps> Jesus saves him. Jesus saves him. Oh, Peter. <sighs> you have a little faith. Hmm. There's more. You saw more. Or how about Matthew 16, when Jesus revealed he was going to be killed? That's what I read to you this morning. Peter puts him off by saying, when he says, the Son of Man will go and die. And Jesus, I'm sorry, and Peter says, Lord, what are you talking about? That will never happen. Really, Pete? Really, Pete? You really just said that to Jesus? <laughs> Way to go, man. Right? And what happens? He's trying to rebu rebuke Jesus. And the, I'm sure the other 11 were there going, oh, man, there, there he goes again. Mr. Big Mouth, you know, put his giant foot right in it. And what happens? Jesus doesn't berate him or call him unthinking or dumb or stupid. He just says, get behind me, Satan. Jesus knew that Peter loved him with the greater good and that at that moment the forces of evil were trying to stir up junk. Right? Hmm, wait, there's more. We see Peter's passion and love for Jesus in the garden. Peter filled with urgency and anticipation when he realizes after they leave the upper room and they think they're going to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. Here they go. And when they get there, notice they were all there at the time, except for one. Peter sees the high priest and his band of merry men coming into the garden. Now, Peter doesn't necessarily panic, although I can't help but think there was some fear going on there, too. But did you notice who was the one who sprung into action when he wasn't asked to do anything? Whoop! And somebody's ear is laying on the ground. And again, let's look at Jesus. Look at Jesus' lens. <laughs> he picks up the ear and restores it to before it happened. Gospel doesn't say anything about Jesus turning and going, oh, Peter, for heaven's sakes, control yourself. 
Gospel doesn't say that. Gospel just says that Jesus restored the man's health. Man, it seems as though through the eyes of Jesus, he is always bailing impulsive Peter out. What do you think? This week, I spent a lot of time thinking about their relationship, Jesus and Peter. I bet you <laughs> Jesus laughed a lot. I bet you he was thinking, wow, out of all the 12, you know, if I want something done, who am I going to go to? There it is, folks. My guess is, and scripture will back that up later on as we read, that Jesus knew from the beginning everything there was to know about uh, Peter's personality and loved him anyway. And not only loved him, but knew that that was just the personality. Take heart, all you impulsive people out there. That it was just the impulsive personality he needed to found his church, church, preach, convert people to the gospel, go throughout time, passionately die for the man who saved him time and time and time again, and thus we get here today because Peter was impulsively passionate about Jesus Christ. Don't let that be lost on you. Have you had instances of God stepping in in your life to smooth things over after you stuck your foot in it? Don't show, no show of hands, I don't want to. I'm not looking. Um, instances of God where after you jumped in too quickly to a family matter <laughs> and you kind of made things worse, that not you... But God stepped in and repaired or smoothed things over for you? If you've had any of those experiences, then you need to understand that Peter and you have a pretty tight relationship. Once again, I say to you, the gospel is full of real life experience, of real, fallible, messy people who Jesus rose up and enabled and picked up after them to make it right. But nonetheless, it takes that certain kind of individual. What's that? A Jesus believer. A believer that there is a power bigger than you that is in control of the world, amen, and you. Well, we've got one uh, example this morning of, of Peter left, and I saved it till last, because, hmm, uh, just because. Then there's Peter outside the gate, going into the gate after they took Jesus away. They arrested him. And I don't know what was going through his mind, but I know that he had just said earlier, Jesus, everybody will deny you, but I never will. And I can hear it in my head, imagining that it was loud and boisterous and passionate. And he believed that with his heart and his soul and his mind. Jesus, the whole world can deny you, but I will stand with you. I've got your back. Let's go. And less than 24 hours later, he sees Jesus carried off by the Romans. He knows that he's bound. He's got a pretty good idea of what Jesus told him earlier in the week. It wasn't just baloney, that indeed 
some terrible things were happening. And what does he do? He wants to be close to Jesus. He's trying, get this, don't let this be lost on you. He is trying to do the right thing, like he said, stand up for him, help him, save him, guard against him. And what does he do? He gets up to the gate and he sneaks in through the gate and he sits down by that campfire with other people, that pot, and he's warming his hands because it's chilly outside. And then push comes to shove. And somebody says, hey, hey, you, you there. You were with him. I saw you. Weren't you? Not me. I don't know. No, must have the wrong guy. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And we imagine that he gets up and he moves over to another spot perhaps a little bit back. He's not sitting now, he's standing. And he's trying to see what they did with his Jesus, who is now in the court. And here comes this woman. I, I know you. You were one of his followers. What are you talking about, woman? I don't know the guy. It must have been somebody else. A lot of people look alike. It wasn't me. I don't know. Hmm. And he probably backs up a little further and kind of tries to disguise himself a little bit, but he still is distraught because Jesus is still there and he can't get to him. So he thinks. And some guard with a fairly boisterous voice, says to the people gathered around, that guy there, that guy over there, right there, I know, he was with Jesus, he's one of them. And then Peter, we imagine, curses <laughs> and says, I don't know what you're talking about, it's not me, what the heck are you doing? Leave me alone, I do not know the man. Er, 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 er. I imagine he freezes. I would. I probably would be paralyzed. I would try to move my feet. Probably couldn't. Because at that moment, Peter gets everything that Jesus said to him since the time he met him. Everything is running through his head. Oh my goodness, oh, 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 everything he said is true. What did I just do? And he runs into the dark. Now, fairly dramatic episode in the life of Jesus and Peter, isn't it? Have you ever said one thing and then done exactly the opposite? My guess is yes, I'm not looking. And a lot of the times those saying one thing and, and doing another isn't very hurtful. It, it doesn't have a great impact on the world or your family or your friends or your own life. But I'm wondering if, like Peter, you've had one of those instances where you have said something boldly and then, with your actions, done exactly the opposite. That's what we're talking about today, friends. That's what we're talking about. Now, I don't know whether you saw in one short clip on the video, there was a moment that they showed him in the garden, and it says in the scriptures that for one moment, Jesus and Peter's eyes met that night. 
<laughs> and Peter ran. So what happens? Let's jump ahead. Pathetic as these events seem, I'm wondering if you and I wouldn't have done anything different. Fearing for your own life, not sure that you wanted to be identified with a radical movement where the majority of the world thinks one way and you think another. I think we can identify with that. Maybe you are looking at Peter today and you're saying, Peter, before we, we had this discussion, couldn't you just step up a little bit more? Come on, guy. You know? Get some courage. Suck it up. Do the right thing. Yeah, right. We weren't there. Peter then goes through the next days, 48 hours. Doesn't say anything in the gospel about what happens to him after that. Until the morning. And Mary Magdalene gets there. Wow. Wow. What's going on? Runs back. Scripture says she went back to get James and John and Peter. And they race over there because they think she's crazy. Crazy woman, but okay. Scripture tells us this, that when the stone was moved away, John, respectfully, and I'm thinking probably also out of fear, stands outside the tomb, at the door of the tomb. He's not sure he wants to go in there. Or, you know... It, it's the place where our, our Savior is dead. and We're not supposed to walk on that kind of holy ground. And whatever his reasoning was, he stopped. John stopped and looked in. Down the pathway, here he comes. He does not stop at the door to check it out. What does Peter do? He runs all the way in. And stands over the slab. Boom! And at that moment, he realizes something profound. Jesus isn't there. And instead of rejoicing, so you would think, right? Stay with me. Instead of rejoicing and running out to tell everybody, it's true, it's true, everything he said is true. <laughs> it's our friend Peter. He races and he runs home and locks himself in the upper room. He's afraid. He doesn't know what to think of it. He's not sure. Did the Roman government come and take his body? Here we are. Good old human Peter. Let's fast forward. We know, eventually, Jesus met up. He walked down the Emmaus Road. He spent some days, and finally, he appears in the upper room, boom -o, through the locked door. And there he is with the 11. And who does he go to first? You know. He doesn't go down the receiving line and shake people's hands. We imagine that he walked over and he put his hand on Peter. And technically from that time on, all of Peter's idiosyncrasies, all of his impulsiveness, all of those things turned into boldness for Christ compassion for people who need to understand about Christ 
energy to keep preaching and uh, preparing and training people to spread the gospel that he now believed with every single fiber of his being. And you know what? You do know what. I know you guys. He died on a cross just like his Savior. The Bible is full of human interest stories. The point is, let its inherent truth pierce through your veneer of making your way in the world as a good person, doing the right thing, and yes, I'm Christian. Let the life of Peter pierce through that veneer so that you can walk and live and be who God created you to be in the way he created you to be it and know that no matter what happens to you in this life, you are a person who God uses to spread the love of Jesus to people who desperately need to know about it in this world today. There it is. End of story for now. The life of Jesus viewed through the lens of Peter. Holy God, we come to you this day and we say thank you, God, for giving us the disciples so that we can learn and reflect and integrate their stories into our lives. Lord God, we thank you for the blessings you give us every day. Lord God, we at this time return those blessings to you so that you can help us do the important work in this world 
Our world is desperately in need of your grace and your mercy. Lord God, help us do your work. Amen. Please be seated. And I ask you this day to join your hearts with me in prayer as we go to our God. Heavenly God, you are the master of the universe. Praise God. Lord God, at times this world may seem like you have put us in a den of chaos. Lord God, you never said that chaos would be all we would know. You said, as you said to Peter, put your eyes on me, leave your eyes on me, and I have overcome the world so that you may experience peace and love and joy. Lord God, we gather this morning and we say, we are a people in need of seeking your peace. God, like Peter, we come with our own faults and our own judgments and our own ideas. Lord God, that you give us the grace and the mercy to check in with you before we, like Peter, mouth off and say something that you will have to help us retract. Lord God, you also promised us that this would not be a perfect world or a perfect experience for us until we are joined with you in everlasting life. So God, like Peter, be with us when we fall, be with us when we screw up, be with us in our sad efforts to try to live for you. Remind us that we are loved by you no matter what. Help our hearts sense at its deepest place your spiritual care for us. Lord God, you are the savior of the world. And you have done that once, one time, for all people. God, that your grace may overflow abundantly while we walk this journey with you to save as many in the world as we can with your gospel. Lord God, we ask for your healing hand as we saw Jesus heal over and over again. People rise from the dead, people healed of their afflictions and iniquities. Lord God, we lift up this day Don Coates, who will be going for surgery on March 8th to replace a heart valve. Lord God, be with him. Lord God, be with those cardiac surgeons who know how to do their job with your hands guiding them. Lord God, be with Lou Varen, who is kind of running low on energy at this point in her chemo. Remind her that her energy and strength comes from you and no one else. Lord God, we ask you to be with everyone who is struggling to walk up that hill called Golgotha in our own lives. Lord God, our ways are not your ways. So help us to find peace of heart while we are still on, once again, this Lenten journey for you. Give us new insights. Give us new grace. Give us new peace. In your son's name, we ask all of this. Amen. And God, we're going to return to you the prayer your son taught us to pray. Our Father, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. And during this Lenten season, I invite you now, if you're able, to rise and let us uh, affirm our faith in the words of the Confession of Belhar. Let's concentrate on these words. We believe that the unity of the people of God must be manifested and be active in a variety of ways that we share one faith, have one calling, and are of one soul and one mind, have one God and Father, are filled with one spirit, are baptized with one baptism, eat of one bread and drink of one cup, confess one name, are obedient to one Lord, work for one cause, and share one hope. We believe that the church must together come to know the height and the breadth and the depth of Christ's love. We believe that we must together know and bear one another's burdens, thereby fulfilling the law of Christ. We believe that we are called to admonish and comfort one another, to suffer with one another for the sake of righteousness, to pray together and together serve God in this world. Amen. And I invite you to remain standing. And our closing hymn this day is Be Thou My Vision in the blue book number, I can't see it, three something. Thank you. 339. One. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ go with you this Lenten season, each and every hour of each and every day. And together with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, grant you Peter's courage beyond belief so that you can share in this life the glory of the resurrection. Amen.